promised land. Though there's pain within the plan, there is victory in the end. Your love is my path. Jericho, build their walls around my soul. When my heart is overthrown, your love is my battle cry, the anthem for all my life. Every giant will fall, the mountains will move, every chain of the past you've broken into, over fear, over lies, we're singing the truth that nothing is impossible with you. will move every chain of the past we've broken into over fear over lies we're singing the truth that nothing is impossible every giant will fall the mountains will move every chain of the past you've broken into over fear over lies we're singing the truth that nothing is impossible. Oh, nothing is impossible. Good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. If you are a guest this morning, really glad you're here. If you're a member, you're expected to be here. And so we're glad. So, <laughs> thanks for coming out. There is a card on the back of the seat in front of you. You can uh, pull one of those out and uh, any updates to your information. If you're a member for our, uh, for our uh, databases, uh, you can include those, phone numbers, email addresses, those kinds of things. Uh, prayer requests, you can put a prayer request on that and we will be praying about those first thing tomorrow morning. Uh, if you are visiting with us today and you want more information about Twickenham, then indicate that on your card. We'll give you a call this week and uh, set up a time to have a conversation. If you're looking for a church home, we are always looking for new family members. Love to hear about what God's doing in your life. We can talk about what we feel like God is doing here at Twickenham and see where our stories uh, kind of match up and where we can join each other on the journey. Just really glad you're here. Thanks for coming out to be with us. Speaking of something that God is doing, we support one mission work. And we're not the only people who support this mission work, but it's the only mission work we support. That's a decision that our leadership made uh, years ago, and a very wise one, I think, because that way we can focus our attention, our prayers, our giving, our mission giving on that one effort. And the people that work in that mission are not just missionaries that we hear about every now and then, they're more like family members. And so they are with us this morning. I want to ask all five of them to come on up on stage. We have Justin and John Rieger and Jake and Tanya Wilson and their daughter Mila. Can you guys all come on up? And we're gonna have a quick conversation here. And uh, while they're coming, during this awkward pause of people walking forward, why don't you just give them a hand and welcome them to Twickenham. So. So this is Jake and Tanya and Mila. And this is Justin and Jonna. And uh, they, they all work together at a, a place called Hacienda of Hope. Jake and Tanya uh, lead the School of Hope, which is the, the Christian school there. And then uh, Justin and Jonna lead uh, the Hacienda of Hope, the House of Hope, which is a home for uh, children that uh, are either permanently or temporarily in need of a place. So, it, like I said, that's our only mission work. We care deeply about what's going on down there. Many of us have been down there to visit and to serve, and these folks are just like our family. We're really glad to have you guys. So, question number one, I just want to start. Uh, we always ask about the kids in the, in, the, in the haciendas. How are your kids? You've got three. How are they doing? That's fine. Okay, good. Well, yes, we have three, and we haven't, we haven't brought them up here in a long time. We need to bring them. We'll try to do that next summer. But they're doing good. 
They're doing good. They both, we have our, um, a 12 year old, a nine year old, and a six year old. And um, our 12 year old and nine year old went to camp this summer. Am I holding, there, is that better? Okay, sorry. <laughs> so they're doing really good. The nine year old really enjoyed camp. His name is Caleb. And I said, well, uh, what, did you, what did you learn at camp? And he said, well, I got to have a girlfriend. <laughs> okay. <laughs> And he said, and I learned that you cannot waffle. Waffling is bad. And I said, waffling? And he said, yeah. So we went on a midnight hike, and I got to hold hands with my girlfriend. But they said, you cannot waffle. And I said, what is waffling? And he said, it's going like this. <laughs> and, I said, <laughs> and I said, so did you hold his hand, her hand? And she, he's like, well, yeah. I counted to three. I went one, two, three. And I just took my hands out of my pocket, and I held her hand. And I said, well, how did you hold her hand? He said, we pancaked. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so what is pancake? So if, uh, this is pancaking, just in case you guys do not know. And then there's biscuit. And then there's biscuit and gravy. <laughs> so my kids went to American <laughs> Christian camp. And I'm so proud. <laughs> See, now that... That must have been a liberal, a liberal Christian camp because when I, was, when I was in, you had to hold one end of a stick and she had to hold the other end of a stick. So that was... We're at pancaking now. Well, so we, I guess we call that hot links, I guess is what we call that. I don't know. So anyway, all right. Well, good. Your kids are doing well until they come to a U.S. Christian camp and become corrupted. So, all right. Tanya, there was a, in December of uh, 15... Uh, there was a great story about a little boy that was left. Hi, Mila. <laughs> so, sweetie, the sermon hadn't started yet, okay? So, <laughs> she's yawning. You look like some of my members, baby. Uh, great story about a little boy that was found at, like in a shopping center somewhere, and he was hours old, is that right? Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah, and I think we knew him as, as Baby Jesus is the the name we gave him. Can, give us an update on that. Kind of tell us how that went. Baby Jesus or AJ. Um, <clears throat> so AJ lived with us for about a year. Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> um, This is, the, the reason this is good is because you see these are real people here, right? Yeah. Her kid's got a boyfriend, and she girlfriend. wants a <laughs> girlfriend. They're not that real. And she wants a mic. You're at, well, you got two girls, so. <laughs> Go ahead, Tony. I'm sorry. Um, so AJ lived with us for about a year, um, and it was, it was a wonderful time. We learned a lot about being parents. Um, and... <clears throat> He left us in January of this year. Um, he left about a week after Mila was born. So it was a very, very, very interesting time for, for both Jake and I. Um, difficult time. We were really sad, but yet again, we were really excited um, for the birth of our first, our first uh, child. So um, in class today, in Bible class, um, we went to class with Daniel Kaufman, and he talked about Exodus and the people of uh, the Israelites, and um, we talked about the coexistence of blessing and bitterness at the same time. And that was, I feel like, a really good way to describe um, what we were experiencing, that despite the fact that AJ was leaving us, um, we got to experience the blessing of having Mila in our lives. Um, so, and you feel pretty good about the family he went to, right? Yeah, um, and, and you know, that always, of course, helps. We've, we've gotten to see him a few times, um, gotten to know uh, the parents, and they're super, super sweet. They're a wonderful couple, and <laughs> so... Um, you know, he's, he's going to have a great, amazing life. He's got some great parents, and um, we're, we're excited about um, him and his future. 
uh, with, with this beautiful new couple. Now, we, we spent a lot of time praying about him and about you guys for that, and uh, I know that was hard, but also good because he's, he's with a good family. Yeah. So, yeah. Good, it's a good update on him. You guys are doing a lot of building um, down at, at, in, on, on your end of the campus. Tell us a little bit about what, what you're, what's going on there. Uh, this year we have begun construction on a new building, um, and there are lots of buildings on the property. Uh, we have four CASAs that have been built. Uh, and they're, by the way, they're full, right? With full capacity. Full. We are at our maximum capacity. We, when we uh, start out, I guess, four years ago, uh, after the initial uh, uh, children coming in in 2003, uh, we started four years ago with 16 kids when we came in. And we are now at capacity with 40 kids on our campus. Uh, that's a really cool piece. Unfortunately, what that's done is that has uh, made it uh, a little more difficult to do some of the basic pieces that we need to do all the time, which are uh, administration, uh, the paperwork that goes along with that. With that. And uh, so that'll give us uh, some additional uh, uh, offices for, for some of our staff to be able to work out of, and uh, three counseling suites, which will give us the opportunity to provide child therapy uh, and group therapy, and especially family therapy. See, a lot of these kids that you work with and you guys work with are coming out of really traumatic situations. There's been abuse, there's been neglect, and so you can't just... You can't just take care of the basics. You got to take care of the basics, plus try to help rebuild their trust in other people, their self-esteem, things like that. Okay, that's exactly that's exactly it, Jody. And uh, one of the big pieces of what we do is not just work with the kids and their trauma, but also work with the families and the trauma that they've experienced and the traumatic pieces that make their home an unsafe place. Okay. Now, you guys at the over on the school side, the School of Hope. You've done a lot of building, too. You've got a big uh, rec building going up right now? Right. It's, um, it's the same kind of idea that Justin was just saying. We're about to probably be full in our enrollment. We're going to fill the school. There's 250, there's 200? Uh, it'll be 260, 270 Ooh, okay. probably. Um, and so the multi-purpose building is going to serve as another spot. Um, we can have programs. You can have chapel. You can have recess and PE inside out of the rain, things like that, and, and along with a science lab, a music room, and different things, um, a theater, a stage to do performances and things like that. And so it's, you know, it, it's the same type of idea, you know, we're talking about how do we keep growing, but how do we keep providing for people, and so that's one way also that we're doing one, one of the things you need to know is that that sounds like, oh, really extravagant, right? They started in a dairy barn. That's, that, was the, that was their, the school started off in a dairy barn. So you guys are going to add one thing too, right? You've got uh, something you want to do for uh, teen mothers. Yeah, so this, this summer we've been, we were blessed, first of all, to have uh, seven, seven groups come over the summer. But through those groups, I mean, they do amazing things for the community and for the children's home, for the school um, but at the same time, we get connections. Um, and so this summer, we are able to go to six different churches that are not involved with the work. As you guys know, you, you, you guys are paying for four classes, which are 40 children, all the staff. I mean, to, to expand anymore for your church, that's going to be really hard. So we're looking for partner sh churches to help us continue to expand. Something that's come up in this last year, we have uh, two new young ladies, 15-year-old um, young ladies with babies. And we don't have a place to put them where we can teach them how to become the mothers that we want them to be. Um, and so it's kind of, we've, it's been a dream, but God, I feel like, is pushing us to say, hey, it needs to happen now because you already have two children <laughs> that need it. So we're wanting to expand and have a teen mother center um, on the property um, so we can provide a place for mothers to learn how to be mothers, to receive the education they need to, um, to be able to provide for their family. Um, and then also just to work through their trauma. The children that we would get or the young ladies that we would receive would be child, uh, girls that have been um, abused or, or neglected or you know something like that that have had trauma in their lives. And so it'll be specifically for those kind of mothers to come in. Awesome. This is a, a great ministry. It's a, we believe in it here at Twickenham. Earlier this year, we gave over $250,000 in one yeah. day to support this. It's a thing that's on our hearts and will be on our hearts and prayers and in our pocketbooks for a very, very long time. Let's say a prayer and ask God to bless these folks. Holy Father, we are thankful for 
Jake and Tanya, for Justin and Jonna, for their families and for the work that they do. We lift up the Hacienda, we lift up the School of Hope, and we ask you to bless the children and the families that are there. We pray for healing. We pray for these young teen moms who can learn how to live uh, and take care of themselves and their children. We pray for the kids and the teachers at the School of Hope that uh, those children that are traumatized can continue to grow intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, uh, just as Jesus did. We just pray for these precious servants of yours, that you would give them the energy and the wisdom they need to carry out this mission. We pray for protection over their families and their children, and that you would bless their children with good health and with good friends and good influences. We lift them up and ask you to bless them in every conceivable way to take care of them. And I pray that all of their work through this summer to continue to, to gain a greater uh, both financial and spiritual support will be beyond their wildest dreams in terms of success. Thank you for these precious folks. Bless them and care for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, let's stand. Give somebody nearby a hug and a handshake. Let them know you're glad you're here and we'll get, we'll get going in just a second. When my hope and strength is gone, you're the one who calls me on. You are the light, you are the fight within my soul. Oh, your resurrection power burns like fire in my heart. When waters rise, I lift my eyes up to your throne. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord. Our God, our conqueror. I will see into the night. Christ is risen and on high. Greater is he living in me than in the world. No surrender, no retreat. We are free and we're redeemed. We will declare over oh, despair, you are the whole. We are more than conquerors through Christ. You have overcome this world, this life. We will not bow to sin or to shame. We are defiant in your name. You are the fire that cannot be tamed. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. Nothing is impossible, every chain is breakable with you. We are victorious. You are stronger than our hearts, you are greater than the dark with you. We are victorious. You are the power in our veins, our Lord, our God, our conqueror, our Lord, our God, our conqueror. I am not my own, I give up control, you can
if I have all things, or if I have nothing, only you have all my life. Now in heaven and earth, oh, may my voice be heard. I am yours. took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat, this is my body. God, we owe all to you. 
as we come before the cross this morning to remember the sacrifice that you've made for us. We see the broken body given on our behalf, and once again we worship in awe as we share it together. In Jesus' name and all that agree said, amen. took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Father, as we prepare to drink this cup, we stand in awe of your amazing grace. We remember the words of Paul, shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. As we drink this cup, Father, help us renew our vow to you to be faithful, to love you even as you have loved us. We love you, Father, through Christ we pray. Amen. to Jesus I surrender all to Him I freely give I will ever love and trust in His presence day 
If you want to uh, look in your Bibles, we're going to be in Luke chapter 19 to start with, uh, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 18. We're going to end up in Luke chapter 19, but Luke 18, it's uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third book in the New Testament, in uh, chapter 18 in just a, a minute. We are closing out our series this morning, uh, Right on the Money, Me, My Stuff, and God, and uh, some of you are like... Finally, awesome. I appreciate the response you've had to this. Had a lot of good exchanges offline um, and online uh, with uh, many of you, and so I appreciate the way you've received it. In a in a couple of a few weeks from now, a couple of weeks from now, not next week, but in a couple of weeks from now, we're going to start uh, a, a back to school series uh, from the book of Daniel called Even If. And we're a couple of weeks away from that. I want to let, we got a, a bunch of the teens that are downstairs uh, working with Amy Smith, our children's minister. Uh, and uh, when they're done with their summer, those kids will be back up. So we're going to put that on hold for a couple of weeks. 
but be praying about that, would you? Uh, series on the book of Daniel, even if, and pray about our kids and our teachers and our administrators and everybody that's work and our parents, uh, everybody that's working with kids in school. It's all we're all in this together. So we're going to take a look and see what God's word says about navigating uh, that part of our culture. So we have asked a lot of really uncomfortable questions in this series on our stuff. And as we close out today, I thought it would be fun to ask four more really uncomfortable questions. So here's the, let's get right into it. Here's the first one. If Jesus came back today, who would he spend time with? People like us? Or people like the folks in Tabacundo, Ecuador, folks at Hacienda and School of Hope. I mean, would he visit uh, an upper middle class, predominantly white church in the Bible Belt? Or would we be sitting in our comfortable homes watching our big screen TVs of news coverage of Jesus and his visit to a third world orphanage? Would would Jesus, as Mary sang, his mother, in Luke 2, fill the hungry with good things, but send the rich away empty? See what I mean by uncomfortable question? In Jesus' inaugural sermon, Luke chapter 4, he said himself, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. In Luke chapter 6, verse 20, he said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And then four verses later, he said, Woe to you who are rich. So just to be clear, when he's talking about rich, it's everybody in this room. Okay, I don't care how much you feel like you don't have in comparison to the people you live around, in comparison to most of the people in the country and certainly all of the people in the world, we are rich. So Jesus just said, woe to us, W-O-E. So it seems pretty clear that Jesus would want to spend time with the poor and not with us, right? That's what it seems. There was Matthew as an exception. Matthew was one of the 12 apostles, one of the chosen 12, and he was wealthy enough to host a party for Jesus in his home and invited a lot of his wealthy friends. And so by by their standards in that time and place, Matthew was rolling in it. So Jesus welcomed Matthew. Peter, Andrew, James, and John Probably not wealthy, but they probably weren't impoverished either. They would have been middle-class working families. So he obviously was comfortable with them. Jesus commended the faith of a Roman centurion, and they were pretty well off. He healed the daughter of a synagogue ruler, and as you all know, clergy always brings down the dough. In John 4, he healed the son of a royal official. He was supported by a group of wealthy women who followed him everywhere he went, one of whom was married to Herod's chief of staff. So he associated with them. Tax collectors were frequently in his company, and they were by no means poor. And he was often a guest of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, another family that was at least middle income, if not a little on the high side. And then there are a couple of stories in Luke that I think we should really just slow down and hear. Stories about when Jesus spent some time with people like us and how that time affected them. First one's in Luke chapter 18. I'm going to begin reading in verse 18, and you join me um, just in hearing this passage, hearing the word, and let's see what we can learn from it, okay? A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. 
you know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All of these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples who were with him said, who then can be saved? And Jesus replied, what's impossible with people is possible with God. Easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. Have, have you heard the explanations before about how, well, really what that's talking about, there was like this gate in Jerusalem that they called the needle's eye and camels had to get down on their knees to crawl through. Have you heard that before? That's not what he's talking about. He means a real needle and a real camel. Okay? I have a hard time getting, yeah, that. He's, I have a hard time getting my fishing line through the hoops on my fishing pole, much less a camel through the eye of a needle. Jesus' point is just what you think it is. It is hard for people who have a lot of stuff to recognize their need, humble themselves, and submit to God's lordship. It is hard for people who are accustomed to getting their way to let God have his. That's, see, that's the problem with wealth. That's the problem with resources. It enables us to get our way more often than not. And people who are accustomed to getting their way have a hard time letting God have his way. Now, when Mark tells this story, the, the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when Mark, the second gospel, tells this story, he adds an interesting detail. He says that Jesus looked at the young, the rich young, we know this guy is the rich young ruler. Jesus looked at him and loved him. Apparently, Jesus wanted to spend time with the wealthy young man. The problem was the wealthy young man did not want to spend enough time with Jesus. And maybe, so maybe we asked the wrong question. If Jesus came back today, the it's not if Jesus came back today, would he want to spend time with people like us? The question is, would people like us want to spend time with him? Now, there's another story about Jesus' uh, experience with someone like us, and that's in Luke chapter 19, one, uh, one chapter over, and verses 1 through 10. So I want to hear that one with you too. Okay, here we go. Jesus entered Jericho. This is right after this encounter he had with uh, the rich young ruler, the rich young man who didn't want to give up his stuff. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacche Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was so short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. I, oh, I have always loved this story. When I was a kid, I loved this story. When, um, in fact, I was like four years old in Sunday school and they went through this story with us. And the teacher told the story, and then we sang the song, and then we did the handwork, you know, the little stuff that you do. And, and then the teacher, who was a really good teacher, said she thought it would be a good idea if she asked the class to retell the story that we'd just been over like three times in three different media. And so I just raised my hand real quick, because I've always been a little quick. And she said, Jody, can you tell the story? And I said, yes. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. And a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. And along came Jesus. 
And Jesus looked up in that tree and said, Zacchaeus, you come down out of that tree or I'll huff and I'll puff and I'll blow your house down. <laughs> missed a, I missed a detail. detail. That's a true story, I'm told. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions. You, this is an important moment, okay? Something really miraculous is about to happen. A rich man's about to go through the eye of a needle here. Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man, Jesus, came to seek and save the lost. I love that story because... It defies our expectations, ours and the people of Jericho. Does Jesus love the poor? Oh, yeah. No question about that. In the story just before this one in Luke 18, he heals a poor, blind beggar. Jesus loves the poor. Week after next, we're going to look at that very story in our midweek spring. By the way, we had a great time Wednesday night. If you, were, if you were here, that was an awesome, awesome event, our midweek spring where we had our instrumental service on a Wednesday night. I did some teaching with a series called What Would Jesus Ask? And we, just, we had a great night, great big, big turnout, a lot of excitement, just a great night. And since some of you didn't, we ran out of Steel City Pops, since some of you didn't get one, we're going to have Steel City Pops again. And those of you who didn't get one, like me, and Lincoln get to be first in line next time, all right? So Jesus absolutely loved the poor. We're going to look at that, the, the story about Jesus heal, healing the poor blind beggar a uh, week after next. Jesus loved the poor, but he loved Zacchaeus too. In fact, Jesus is the only person in Jericho who loved Zacchaeus. And as soon as Zacchaeus accepted Christ's love, it changed everything about his life, even the way he managed his money. Because Jesus does that. But the thing I love most about this story is that it provides a much needed balance to the story, that first story back in Luke 18 the, about the rich young ruler where Jesus said it was hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier, he said, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for, the rich to, for a rich person to submit to God's rule. Fifteen verses later, you get a story about a rich guy entering the kingdom of God. That's just cool. It is a fact that Jesus spent a lot of time with the poor, but it is also a fact that he loved people like us too. And if he came back for a visit, I think he might actually spend some time with us. In fact, I think he might ask us some questions based on these two stories. So I told you we were going to do four questions. The first one was, was Jesus spend time with people like us? The answer is sure. Here are the other three questions, and this is what I think he would ask us. I think if you have resources, if you have possessions, or at least the liquidity to acquire them, I think Jesus would ask, how did you get it? How did you get your resources? How did you get your money, your possessions? The rich young man, the first guy that we looked at, the guy that walked away because he wouldn't sell it all, apparently inherited his. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with being lucky. Nothing wrong with being blessed or being in the right place at the right time or making good financial decisions or working hard. However you got it, if you, if you did it honestly, okay. It's when we exploit other people or lie or cheat or steal that we cross a line and the question, how did you get it, becomes something we have to really deal with. Zacchaeus, now he was a cheater. He admitted it. Most tax collectors in those days were. The Romans had a set amount they required the people to give. Tax collectors would charge people more than the Romans asked and keep the difference. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible calls us to honesty, integrity, and honor. If you have money, how did you get it? 
if you got it honestly, good for you. But if you got it dishonestly, if you got it through exploiting other people, then you need to confront that question. That question confronts you. Second question, what are you doing with it? How did you get it and what are you doing with it? Now, neither Zacchaeus nor the rich young ruler had a good answer for that one. Neither one of them. Apparently, both of them were using their money to build and maintain their own little kingdoms. They were using money only for themselves. So, what are you doing with it is a great question for us, too. A couple of sermons back in this series, we talked about Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 6, where he warned us not to treasure things, not to value things, not to build our lives around things that can be consumed, depreciated, used up, worn out, stolen, lost, destroyed, or rendered obsolete. Don't build your eternal life on temporary things. In that context, a few verses later, he commanded us to seek God's kingdom first. Seek first his kingdom. In other words, your faith and your finances are connected. What you, do, what you and I do with our money is connected to our faith. They waffle, okay? They waffle. So the question, what are you doing with your money and your possessions, is critical. I, I want to challenge you to do something. I really want you to, if, you, if you've never done this, I really want you, I want to challenge you to do it. And I, it's like, you know, it's not, it won't be fun, but it'll be good. We're, we're right at the beginning of the month, starting tomorrow. Track your after-tax spending for the rest of this month. Track your after-tax spending for the rest of this month. It's a, it's a personal spending audit. You don't have to share it with anybody. You don't have to tell me about it. In fact, I don't even want to know it. Do, just do it for yourself. Track every dollar, and at the end of the month, Go back and look at where your dollars went and what they went for. If you're normal in this church, well, that really doesn't apply here because nobody here is. If you're like a lot of Americans, the average middle-income family will spend around 35% on housing. Wow, that is a really good pie chart. Thanks, Stuart. Good job. Average family will spend about 35% on housing, That's the mortgage, the rent, utilities, furnishings, insurance, upkeep. Food will run in the neighborhood of 12%. Transportation, 20%. Healthcare, 10%. That gets older, uh, that gets higher the older you get. So just to keep, and this is not, these are not hard numbers. This is just kind of the average here. You may be a little higher, a little lower in some area. But just to keep a roof over our heads and food in the fridge and a car to get us from here to there in healthcare, we're spending about 77% of what we have. It's about what it takes for most people. Yours may be a little higher, a little lower. Most of us are going to live in that 70% range. It gets really interesting when you see where that other 20 to 23% goes. Is there any room in your budget for other people? Is any part of your budget any part of your income going toward kingdom of God priorities. This is why you need to do a spending audit, to find out, just to see. And again, you don't have to tell anybody. This is between you and the Lord. But this could be one of the most convicting things you do this year. Okay, question number one is, how'd you get it? Question number two is, what are you doing with it? And question number three is the worst one of all. What's it doing to you? What is your money? What are your possessions doing to you? The rich young ruler, first guy we looked at, would have to answer that question this way. It's keeping me from following Jesus. Zacchaeus had to answer it this way. It's turning me into a monster. Jesus turned me back into a human being. I think that's why Jesus had two different responses to the rich young ruler and to Zacchaeus. Jesus knew that the only way for the rich young man to be free was to give it all away. He was totally possessed by his possessions for reasons we will never know. Zacchaeus was not as addicted or trapped or imprisoned. Depending on which quote website you ask, it was P.T. Barnum or Francis Bacon or Alexander Dumas who said, 
Money is an excellent servant, but a terrible master. Regardless of who said it, it's the truth. Money and possessions can cause us to trust things more than God, to cherish things and use people, to be so accustomed to getting our way that we never let God have his. What is your money doing to you? One more thing. We began by asking who Jesus would spend time with if he came back. Here's the thing that we don't talk about very often, but he is coming back, you know. And everybody, rich or poor, everything in between, will spend some time with Jesus. And on that day, there will only be one question, just one. Was he your Lord? Was Jesus your Lord? Because if he's not your Lord, he can't be your Savior. And that's the most important question you will ever ask. If that's been on your heart and mind, we'd love to talk with you about it. Let us know. I'll be hanging around here after the service. Let's stand. Let's sing a song together. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all
whole church said, what a good morning, amen? Always great to have the Wilsons and the Riegers here, and they, go, they do such good work. I told you a couple weeks ago when I got back from Ecuador, what a great work is happening there, and it is not easy. It is a difficult work, and they are dedicated to it because they're dedicated to the Lord, and so it's great to have them with us. These other things this morning as we close, there is a baby shower today for Jeff and Brittany Taylor. That's 1.30 to 3. It's in the Mercy Building. They're expecting a boy, and they're registered at Babies R Us, so support that baby shower today. As Jody mentioned, um, we moved the spring to Wednesdays for the month of August, and we did some calculations. We figured it's the first day of school. It's a Wednesday night. We will have 120 people here. Boy, were we wrong. We had 220 people here. Yeah, thanks, Ron. So here's the deal. I'm going to have 220 Steel City Pops here, which means I need all of you back or else I have too many popsicles. Got it? So I expect to see all of you and more back Wednesday night at 615 for that. Uh, teens, you have a movie night here at the building, 530 to 730 tonight. You're playing four on a couch. I don't know what that is. Maybe they teach you how to hold hands. I don't, maybe that's. <laughs> Next Sunday night, there is an ice cream social because we seem to like ice cream a lot. For the Gendrons, our new youth ministry team, Caleb and Ashley. And it's our annual ice cream social, so there will be a competition. And you know, the best thing about the ice cream social is when you bring ice cream. Because if you don't bring it, we don't have any. So get your mixers out, make some homemade ice cream, bring it here, let's have a bunch. We'll have a great time together. We'll get to know them better with some games and activities. Um, Wayne and Linda Mobley. Linda, congratulations for putting up with him for 60 years today. 60 years, <laughs> Wayne and Linda Mobley. I hope your day continues to be as good as it has, has been this morning. Have a great week. We love you all. Let's close in prayer. Let us pray. Uh, dear God, thank you for this another great, beautiful day that you've given us that you didn't promise us. And thank you for all your love, mercy, and grace that you've, you've bestowed upon us that that we don't deserve and where we feel so blessed that we can uh, be a part of this church and uh, we can be a part of uh, missions not only here but uh, also in Ecuador and uh, you bless these missions so much please continue to bless them so that uh, your children can be helped and ultimately you can get the glory uh, <clears throat> please be with us this week as, as we go in the world, and uh, we uh, pray that we can hopefully, if it's your will, be back here the next appointed time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.